it's great to be here. My name is uh, Carol Kaminsky, uh, and you can hear from, I'm not from around here. Um, I'm from the south, like way south, um, Australia, and I've uh, been here for about 20 years and uh, met my husband when I was at Gordon Conwell, came here to study. Uh, we have two boys, as, some, as uh, has already been mentioned, and we live in Salem, Massachusetts. Well, I wanted to, first of all, say thanks for having me here. I just really enjoyed um, the time and especially just really seeing your hunger for the Lord. It's been a great encouragement for me. So I want you to know that. So as we start and think through this theme of grace that we've been looking at, I want to ask you a question. I want to ask you this question. When you think about God in the Old Testament, what comes to your mind? When you think about God in the Old Testament, what comes to mind? Do you think of God as a God of anger, a God of wrath, maybe a jealous God, holy God, loving God, gracious God? What comes to mind? Let me give you what Richard Dawkins says of God in The God Delusion. The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it and petty, unjust, unforgiving, control freak. A vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser. Maybe some of you are familiar. How many people are familiar with that? A right. number of you. If you're familiar with this quote, it goes on and on and on. Now, I think we realize that that's an extreme. But maybe there's some of that residue that we all have about God. Or maybe you have the Mark Twain view, and this is what he says, God's so atrocious in the Old Testament, so attractive in the New, the Jekyll and Hyde of sacred romance. So Old Testament, God of wrath. New Testament, God of love. Uh, I mentioned that I teach at Gordon Conwell, but I also do a lot of uh, workshops in churches. And one of the things that I quite often hear is, oh, I really don't like God in the Old Testament. Not a great thing to say to an Old Testament professor to begin with, right? Not the best thing. But I really, I really just like Jesus. And so what we see actually is part of that view kind of percolating. So I want to ask you what comes to mind when you think about God. Uh, I've been reading a book by A.W. Tozer or rereading it, The Knowledge um, of God. If you haven't read it, it's just one of those gems. And what is interesting, at the beginning of the book, he says that your whatever comes to mind when you think about God, and he says it's not like the denomination you go to or the church or even the creeds, but what you think deep down inside, he says that is actually the predictor of what your spiritual walk is going to be like in the future. And why are we talking about who God is in the Old Testament? Because the writer to the Hebrews talks about, and we've done, been thinking about this this weekend, and John did a lovely job helping us unpack the throne of grace. But why am I talking about God in the Old Testament when we're in the book of Hebrews? Because the throne in the book of Hebrews, every time it's mentioned, it is God's throne. And the writer to the Hebrews is defining it as a throne of grace. And what does that mean? It means that the God who is enthroned is gracious. It's gracious, and this is his theology. So what you think about God impacts whether you will actually draw near to him. We have two teenage boys. Uh, two teenage boys, they work out with parents who's going to answer in what way, and they decide who they go to based on what they need. Oh, mum, I'm feeling sick today. Could I stay home from school? Comes to me. They're teenage boys. They'll come and say to my dad, Dad, can I drive on the highway? And I'll be like, go and see your father. Not me. If anyone's been through that, you know how scary that is. Right? You see, they think about how I will respond or how my husband will respond. And they go to, and sometimes they'll do it when we're both in the same room and they'll be asking my husband something and I'll step in or other way around and they'll go, oh, no, no, I'm talking to dad right now, just making it clear, right? So my question for you is, what do you think about with God in the Old Testament? So here's what I think is going on. I hear a lot in churches that people don't, don't quite know how to read the Old Testament. They're not sure about it. 
Marcion in the second century, he didn't like the God of the Old Testament, said he was a God of wrath, and so basically kind of the Old Testament was out of the can, it was the New Testament. Now we don't do that today, but what we do do is we don't read the Old Testament. We just read the New, we kind of set it aside. And so underneath that is, I'm not sure about the God of the Old Testament and I'm not sure about the way he works. Not only are we not reading the Old Testament, we have, of course, the low biblical illiteracy which we know about. Let me give you a couple of statistics. Kenneth Briggs, a new book that's just come out, he's a journalist, uh, religion editor for the New York Times, traveled around the country, two years. First point, his main point is consumption of Bibles is at an all-time high. U.S. sales estimate 25 million yearly. About over half of those are produced in China. Go figure that out. <laughs> Estimated there are about 80,000 versions of the Bible. Adventure Bible, Family Life Bible, Homeschool Mums Bible, Busy Mums Bible, Firefighters Bible, Law Enforcement Officers Bible, Outdoorsman Bible. That has all branches, it's pretty cool looking. The Green Bible, which you know is what color? The Green Bible even has organic chai tea bags <laughs> with Bible verses on them, recycled paper, to match your Bible. And so he says, yeah, we're selling lots of Bibles, but guess what? No one's reading them. United Kingdom Bible Society did a survey of British parents. 30% don't know Adam and Eve are in the Bible. 27% think Superman either is or might be a biblical story. One in three believes Harry Potter is or might be a biblical story. 54% said Hunger Games is or might be a biblical story. I kid you not. <laughs> right? Barna said, 60% of Americans can't even name five of the Ten Commandments. 12% of adults believe that Joan of Arc was Noah's wife. I kind of like that one. <laughs> A considerable number thought the Sermon on the Mount was preached by Billy Graham. All right, you're graduating high school students. This is in the British, oh, this is the Barna studies. This is an American context. Over 50% thought Sodom and Gomorrah were husband and wife. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever seen Jay Leno when he does his Bible trivia, jaywalking. Uh, he asks some, one guy, what's the opening line of the Bible? A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. <laughs> He also has, it's in his um, US history one, he asked this lady, this is not Bible stuff, but what is the, um, uh, do you know the Gettysburg Address? And she says, yeah, I know it. And he goes, well, um, can you give it to me? And she goes, well, I don't know the exact address. So <laughs> that's my favorite. <laughs> Lifeway poll says regular church attenders, over 40% read their Bible only occasionally, once or twice a month. Think of that. 40%, that's nearly half. One in ch five churchgoers say they never read the Bible. And here's what I want you to notice, that if we're not reading our Bibles and we don't know the biblical stories, our view of God is coming from somewhere other than the Bible, right? It's coming from the cultural view of God. Right? The categories are coming from God, and in the Old Testament, that is called idolatry. Because when you get a category of God, like the Israelites when they build the golden calf, why do they build a cow? Because they saw it in Egypt. And they are getting using the cultural language to describe God. So what we're seeing is not just biblical illiteracy that's the problem, it's the fact that therefore people are getting their categories of God and gets what the Rich and Dawkins and whoever else out there, or Oprah or whoever it may be, Joel Osteen, whoever it... <laughs> Don't get me started there. No. <laughs> it's another story, I'm not going to. But my point is, 
we've got to get our categories from the Bible. So I want to ask you this morning, again, when we're thinking about who is this God, if you think he's the God of anger or the God of wrath, I'm here to say to you that you don't know the living God. As we think about who God is, I just want to focus on one thing in the Old Testament, and it's the name of God. Genesis chapter 1 begins, Bereshit bara Elohim et ha-shamayim ve-et ha-aretz. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The word used for God there is Elohim. It's the everyday word for God. But in Genesis chapter 2 verse 4, which is a retelling of the creation story, we find out that the God who created in chapter 1 is the Lord God Elohim. Yahweh Elohim. And in fact, from chapter 2, verse 4 onward, it keeps on saying, the Lord God, the Lord God, the Lord God. Well, what's so special about the Lord God? When I was at um, seminary, I had a professor, and he said to me, when you're at seminary, you need to study and get to know the divine name. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. So as soon as I had an opportunity, I did a paper, and I looked up the grammar of the divine name that it comes from the verb to be. And I looked at whether it's the third person masculine causative verb or the Cal Hebrew verb. Did all this interesting work, but I finished it and I thought, I'm not sure I got to what he was trying to tell me. And I wasn't sure what he was trying to say, except that he said, you've got to know the divine name. See, he wasn't talking about the grammar or the etymology of the divine name. He was talking about the context and the story associated with the giving of the divine name. Let me give you an illustration. Uh, when I was in England, uh, I was studying at Cambridge and I met a good friend of mine, um, Joy, her name is, and um, there's something very special about the name Joy. It's not to do with the etymology. You could think about it, it means happiness or pleasure. You could look at the origin of the French background with the name, but that was not why her name was special. Her name was special because it told a story of who she was. And here's the story, just very briefly. Joy's parents were both YWAM veterans, prayer warriors. If you've anyone been involved in YWAM here in the McAlpine, McAlpines, people know them. They're the veteran. They had a gift for praying for people when they couldn't have kids. His name was Campbell, and there are several churches that named, when people had kids, they named them Campbell. Hi, Campbell. I'm Campbell. Youth group, hi, Campbell. Right? That's what they were like. Well, when they, Joy's mum was pregnant with Joy, they found out she had breast cancer. And quite serious breast cancer, they didn't think she would make it through. And as her dad was praying and seeking the Lord, the Lord gave him the scriptures from Proverbs saying that there will be difficult times, but joy will come forth in the morning. And they named her Joy. Not only that, but after she was married, when I went back to, um, to America, she got married, they couldn't have kids. They'd struggled to get pregnant. Her mom was um, on her deathbed in hospital. Her mum, one of her last prayers, she prayed over her daughter's womb and said, Lord, open this womb. Her mum died and Joy gave birth to a baby daughter nine months later. So the name Joy is not about the etymology. It is about the story in which her name was given. And I want to suggest to you this morning that the name the Lord God is not about the grammar. When is the story given? We're looking at Genesis 2-4 as the first occasion of the divine name, but that's not when the name's given. The name is given in the golden calf story in Exodus 32 to 34. I'm not going to read it now, but I'm going to encourage you to read it afterwards because we, this is the time when God's name is revealed. So the golden calf story, the Israelites have come out of Egypt they arrive at Mount Sinai, Exodus chapter 19. They enter into a covenant with God, Exodus chapter 20. 
is the Ten Commandments we have. They agree that they're not going to worship idols. They're not going to make them. They're not going to bow down to them. Exodus 24 is the formal covenant ceremony. Remember when Moses sprinkles the blood on them and they commit themselves in covenant to keep the covenant. Then we pick up the story in Exodus 32 to 34 and Moses is up on the mountain receiving the law. And what are the people doing at the bottom of the mountain? They're like, oh, we, we don't know what's happened to Moses. And so they get Aaron, Moses' brother, remember the great high priest, he's going to be the high priest. And they say to him, we've got an idea. Why don't you make us a god? And he goes, oh, go and get me your gold and your silver. So they make a god and they make it in the image of a calf because that's what they saw in Egypt. And they start bowing down and they have a big party and they worship it. And God tells Moses on the top of the mountain, he says, do you know what they're doing? And Moses begins to intercede and God says, I'm going to destroy them. And I'm going to make you a great nation. And God has every right to do that because they've just entered a legal agreement with God saying that they wouldn't worship idols. And Moses intercedes. Then Moses heads down the mountain and when he sees it, he is furious. He throws the tablets to the ground. He gets, and a couple of thousand people are killed. And God tells Moses to rewrite the tablets. And Moses goes up to the mountain again. And he begins to pray, if I have found favor in your sight, show me your glory. And he said that I might know your ways. And God says, you can't see my face, but hide over there. And I'm going to cause all my goodness to pass you by. And he says, at that moment, the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth. This is the revelation of the character of God. And it is because of the character of God that Moses can say to him, God, if I have found favor in your sight, if I and your people have found favor, go with us. Because if you don't go with us, it's all over. Exodus 34 verse 9 is the moment when God is, decides that he's going to go with his people even though they are stubborn and rebellious because this is the revelation of the glory of God. And I want you to notice as you look at it and you read it when you go home that the revelation of the divine name is not when there's a beautiful sunset like, if you've been to Mount Sinai, it is just a spectacular place. When I was a student at Gordon-Conwell, I worked on an excavation at um, a Philistine city called Ekron. And we travelled one weekend to Mount Sinai. And we decided we were going to stay overnight uh, just so that we could see the sunrise. Uh, we, it was not quite what I expected because it was boiling 100 degree temperature. I got at the top of the mountain and there were a group of Australians up there with their beer, <laughs> and they were cooking barbecue, or barbie, <laughs> no shrimp. <laughs> they were cooking up there, and I kind of was like, oh, I bet it. they were a little bit rowdy. It wasn't quite the serene thing, but the, the sunset in the morning is spectacular on Mount Sinai. I want you to know that God doesn't reveal his name when you're having a beautiful, quiet time and you're overlooking the mountains and you're saying, how great is God? That's not when he reveals his name. He reveals his name to Moses in the midst of the mess. Right? It's the worst possible moment in their story. And this is how God's glory is seen. Do you hear that? Let me repeat that, that it is in the midst of the mess that God's glory is seen, that this holy, righteous God is also gracious and compassionate and he goes with and he dwells with sinners. Incarnational. It's the book of Exodus is about the tabernacle, God, God's glory with a sinful people. Now take 
think through Genesis. Genesis chapter 1, Barashit bara Elohim. Genesis 2, 4, the God who is the creator God is the Lord God. Why do you need to know that in Genesis 2, verse 4? Come on now, what's coming next? The fall. You need to know that it is the Lord God because God is going to bring judgment against Adam and Eve, but he also clothes them. Why? Because they are ashamed. He doesn't have to do it. Ham doesn't do it with his father, but they are, and he covers their shame. Cain is a murderer, and who places a protective mark on him? God. He says, well, I think someone's going to come and kill me now, now that I've killed my brother. And you think, yeah. Right? God does. Noah finds favor in God's eyes. Think about the whole book of Genesis. We think it's often about creation, right? When you think about Genesis and origin, think of it. Two chapters on creation. Many more chapters on creation in the book of Job. What is the book of Genesis all about from Genesis chapter 3 to Genesis chapter 50? It is about the messiness of the human story. It's messy if you haven't looked at it recently. Adam and Eve, we have Cain. Think about Noah getting drunk afterwards. What about Lot? His two daughters getting drunk and he sleeps with them and they have kids. Abraham marries his half-sister and then he lies about her and Abimelech almost sleeps with Sarah except God intervenes. What about Jacob when he pretends to be his brother? Deceiving his dad. What about Jacob in terms of getting deceived when he marries the wrong woman? After working for her for seven years. What about Judah sleeping with his daughter-in-law? You might say, well, he didn't know. No, he thought she was a prostitute. <laughs> Joseph and his brothers. I mean, have you ever thought how dysfunctional that is? I mean, it kind of gives you comfort, right? God's not afraid of the mess. He enters into the mess and he turns up and he does his redemptive work. And I want to remind you today, the lives that you are encountering in your own stories, they're messy, right? And the people that you're ministering to, all the stuff that you've got to deal with today, They've got to deal with social media. You've got all the political stuff, all the racial issues. You've got the onset of pornography. The hookup culture. It's all very, very messy. And the church knows it's messy today and they want to retreat. Right? That's what they're doing. They want to pull back. I know because I talk with a lot of people. We need to underscore and remember that the God of Genesis enters into the mess of their lives. And let me just give you one illustration with Abraham. They were John was talking about mission and the presence of God. We usually, if you look at kids' books, I love looking at kids' books because they really tell what we actually think about God. Uh, my work has been with Noah, that if you look at kids' books, it says Noah was a good man. There once was a good man. Uh, I looked at over 50 kids' books, and not one of them mentions divine favor. Genesis 6, 8, but Noah found favor is the turning point in the narrative. And I don't think he's a good man. There's not even a few good men, right? Just one good man, Jesus. He finds favor. He doesn't deserve it. Abraham, if you look at Abraham in kids' books, it says, right, you look at kids' books, there once was a righteous man. He loved God. I want to let you know he didn't love God. He didn't know about God. He's in Ur of Mesopotamia. In Ur of Mesopotamia, the Mesopotamians, they've estimated about 3,000 gods. Not only that, but in Ur, you have a big ziggurat to the moon god. 
You have cult prostitutes. You have belief in magic and demons. The whole shebang. Right? My husband and I live in Salem. We've got about 3,000 witches that live in the city. We know what this stuff's all about. Right? But this is all the stuff. He's there till he's 75 years old. He's not just a little kid coming out of it. He's grown up with this. He doesn't worship the Lord God. But who shows up? The Lord God. And the Lord God said to him, because the Lord God is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. And the Lord God wants his name to be known. Acts chapter 7 says, the God of all glory showed up. Missional, understanding that the missional God doesn't treat people as he deserves, that is what is going to give us hope for the mess of our culture because God doesn't retreat from Abraham and say, he's too difficult, too many idols in that family. Too much of this or that going on. No, the God of the Old Testament initiates in grace. The church has not fully understood this because we think God saves good and righteous people. And if you think God saves good people, there's no hope for our culture today, right? There's no hope for it. And so we think that the good people are in the ark and the bad people are outside. No, the sinners are in the ark. Sinners who have been saved by grace because of God's initiating grace. So we need to have a robust theology of mission, of incarnational God comes to Abraham's home. So when I read Jesus dining with sinners, and I'm like, oh, that's just like God. Of course, he's been dining with sinners through the sacrificial meal for 2,000 years. It's just like God, incarnational. And I want to say to you today, that the problems and the brokenness that you are facing, it is not too difficult for God. He's not afraid of it. It's not new to him. Like, oh my goodness, I can't believe what they're doing today. I mean, right? But people sort of say that, right? I work in Old Testament. My teacher, we go through places like Leviticus. Leviticus 18 and 20, where it talks all about sexual stuff, things you're not to do in warnings against bestiality. Um, I said, just, why is that there? What do you think? Were they doing that? Yeah, they were. Actually, I can give them laws, ancient Near Eastern laws that tell you what beast, you, animal you can copulate with and what you can't. It's not new. God's not afraid of it. He's the creator God. He's the living God. Let me finish with a story and five quick applications in four minutes, 51 seconds. So my husband and I adopted two boys. Uh, they were seven and eight when they first moved in with us. And uh, they were in foster care, 10 different foster homes from the time of 10 onwards. They saw a lot of brokenness. They saw a lot of things that kids shouldn't have seen. And then the Lord brought them to us. And uh, lots of stuff when kids don't have attachment with their biological parents, it messes them up. Right? And so we worked with this wonderful counsellor and this counsellor helped us to think through how to get underneath it. And uh, there was one situation with our youngest son who uh, had just extreme anger over little things that would storm off and flare off and bang, 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 you know. And over one situation, there was one time, this is what the counselor told me to do, you've got to, after the fact, get him next day to draw it out. So I did this, I got this big sheet of paper and I said to him, Ryan, I said, oh, I wasn't quite sure what was going on yesterday. I know you were very mad. Uh, how about you draw, could you draw our family and how you saw what happened? So he drew this picture. And he drew a picture with Ryan in the corner, little kind of Ryan. My husband was over here. He had the big bushy eyebrows and he was like mad and going, go and chop wood. That's what his bubble was. <laughs> Me, I'm lying on the sofa <laughs> with a Diet Coke. Now the Diet Coke was the true part. <laughs> 
I do profess. The big balloon. Ha, 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 probably 50 times. The counsellor said, he's telling you what he thinks of parents. And she said, you have to re-script that for him. So I sat next to him. She said, you've got to sit next to him. And I sat next to him on the sofa and I said to him, Ryan, that must have been very, very upsetting for you. And it looks like someone has made fun of you. And I just want you to know, mum would never do that to you. And I said to him, I want you to know that mum's not like that. And what happens with attachment with adoptive kids is if you only deal with the behaviour, you never get into the real issue of attachment because the kids have not learned to trust a parent. And I want to suggest to you today that some of you may need to have your concept of God rescripted. Because if you think that God is somehow a wrathful, angry God, you're never going to trust him. And you're never going to turn to him when you have time of need. Because with, just like with our son, you can deal with the anger or the behavior but what starts to happen when there's attachment, the anger goes. How about that? And what I'm going to suggest to you is your relationship with the living God is transformative in your life. And I'm going to suggest, how do you rescript five ways? First of all, recognize that your view of God may have been influenced by the culture more than you realize. Okay? You need to do some probing and say, what do I really think about God? Number one. Number two, having thoughts of God that are unworthy of him. Like when Ryan thought I was laughing in him, it wasn't accurate. When you do that with God, it is called idolatry. And there are lots of places in the Old Testament where they say, get rid of the foreign gods, bury them. Get rid of them, and some of you may have to get rid of them. Number three, the questions that you have about the Old Testament, and I know it's not an easy books, all of them. The questions that you have, if you have problems with the Canaanites when they go in and what God's doing, for goodness sake, get some help with it. Talk to people about it. There's no questions that are too difficult. There's not always easy answers, but talk about them. Don't let them fester. Number four, commit yourselves to reading the Bible, the Old Testament as well. If you think of the biblical story being a narrative, you won't understand who Jesus is unless you really understand the Old Testament. Ultimately, God's grace is coming in the person of Jesus, but it's the climactic moment. It's not the beginning of the story. It's the climactic moment, and you won't realize it's climactic unless you know what the story's all about. And number five, ask God, the God of grace, to show you his glory. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are indeed Yahweh Elohim, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth. And we thank you, Father, that you have revealed yourself through your word and you have revealed your grace in the person of Jesus. And we bless you and we praise you for that. And Father, as I think of all these students here and ministry workers and the people that you have called, Father, I'm reminded of the culture and the places in which they are where God is being, your name is being blasphemed and your name is being dishonored. And Father, we recognize that sometimes we take on those views of you and we confess for those thoughts that are unworthy of your holiness and your character. And Father, I pray for each person here in this room that as they seek you, as they read your word, that you would do for them as you did for Moses, that you would cause all your goodness to pass them by. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen.